pretty much all. Uh, we, it's my pleasure to introduce Abhishek Tutar. Uh, Abhishek. Da, da. Huh? da, not do. <laughs> okay. I'm Greek, so you have to <laughs> deal with my uh, mispronunciation of stuff. Uh, Abhishek got his uh, bachelor's in India, then he moved to uh, Ghent and Cambridge University of Cambridge, where he finished uh, his uh, PhD. Uh, he spent some time as a master's student in Edinburgh, yeah. and uh, after that he moved to uh, Urbana. His background is Illinois, uh, where he's doing a postdoc on, uh, with the aerospace uh, department. His background is on electromechanical engineering, yeah. so he fits, he can wear two suits <laughs> as needed. Uh, he's a little bit of electrical, a little bit of mechanical engineer, and now he's doing a postdoc with the aerospace engineering department. So he, I think he's discussing today, now, uh, some uh, MPC and uh, uh, work on uh, Boeing and mm -hmm. uh, resilient MPC and so on. So if you like MPC, you're definitely going to enjoy, enjoy his uh, talk. Uh, with that, I'll give it to you so that you have some time. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, Sorry, just interrupt you one second. Because we have some faculty here that are not going to meet with uh, uh, Abhishek uh, in one-to-one -one meetings or lunch. Try to steal some time, five minutes at the end of uh, this, to at least introduce yourself and have a brief discussion with them. Okay? Well, thank you, George. So, uh, today's talk is designed in a way that I assume absolutely no background, just so that everybody is accommodated in that. So, I will, I will uh, quickly bring everybody to the same and and I will have enough for the people who are experts in this domain as well. So today's talk is on model-based control design and resilience of complex systems. So we should first define what complex systems are. Um, so these are examples, typical examples of complex systems. Um, so the first are fighter aircrafts, not one, but multiple fighter aircraft. So each fighter aircraft is complicated in itself, but we have now many fighter aircrafts who have to fly in certain formation. And then is a humanoid robot, so you know how complex that is because it has to have some intelligence other than control systems going on in it. And then is something to do with climate control and climate change. This is an extraordinarily difficult uh, system because the model is very complicated. The number of variables which appear are enormous, and the uncertainty is also of paramount importance. So doing anything with respect to even understanding climate and to be able to control it is very difficult, and it's a very challenging problem to me. And the next is somewhat known problem, which is of uh, controlling a car or an automotive, but even an automotive control system has many control systems which are interacting with each other. So what we see here are the, what I identify are the common challenges are that all these systems have constraints. So none of these systems can be actuated with infinite energy, right? That is no way possible. Um, and then they are distributed. In a sense, I just explained to you that there are many systems interacting. Then these have fast dynamics because they are mechatronic systems, they are very fast. And then they are time varying. So for example, the weather, you take the aircraft, it has a different performance at some level. If you go at a different height, it has different performance. If the weather conditions change, the effect is different on how you actuate to what you get. So that is time variance. And then the very important keyword which is coming up over the past decade or so is vulnerable. Like, we never thought about vulnerability as a problem before 10 years. So this has to do with security of the system. How secure are they? How vulnerable are these systems? So this is how I define my research in those five keywords. And to solve them, the key idea is that we have to understand the model, how these systems are modeled, to have an understanding of how they react to certain inputs. So that's model-based design control and resilience. You first... Uh, design the system based on a model, then you predict the changes and you control those changes as desired and you make resilient control systems which are not vulnerable anymore. So this is the key idea of this. So the first, I would like to explain a little bit on how a complicated system like an aircraft is modeled. So this is a fixed wing aircraft which you see. Um, 
So this is a six degree of freedom object. So any object, any flying object, any object which is not connected has six degrees of freedom, right? So for example, this aircraft, as you see in the picture, has roll, pitch, and yaw, which are on the x, y, and z axis. And this is, as a left-hand rule, how the x, y, and z are on the aircraft. And so the roll is that way over the x, and then the pitch is in this way, and then the yaw is this direction. So you have forces on those directions. X is the net force acting on X, Y, and Z are the net forces on X, Y, and Z. And L, M, N are the net moments which act on these directions. So now you want to write the equations of motion of this aircraft. So if you see that the, the first set of equations, they represent the equations of motion. Now, this is Newtonian dynamics. So the first ones are translational, and then the other one is rotational. But if you see, these are highly complicated. They are nonlinear, and they have many modes, longitudinal and lateral. So longitudinal would mean that the aircraft is in this way, doing pitching, and it's going up and down. And lateral would mean it is uh, in this plane of motion. So, so these are coupled uh, dynamics there. So extremely complicated. We cannot analyze such systems. Okay? So what we need to do is we need to study this at one particular point which is, in our case, a steady-state uh, flying condition, which is flying at a level height, which, which we always encounter when we are traveling, right? And so we could linearize this system using Taylor series expansion at one particular point, right? We could always approximate a function with the first derivatives. So we could linearize that. And not only can we do that, we can decouple the system. So we can decouple it in the lateral and in the longitudinal modes. So once we do both those tasks, we end up in this linear state space kind of a system where now we are limited to four variables here. So this is the velocity in the vertical direction, and then Q is the angular velocity, of the, which is linked to the pitching, and theta is the pitch angle, and H is the altitude. Now, we know the relationship of these variables through this equation, and delta E is the elevator deflection. So, for example, if this is the aircraft, I will show you by the picture. Um, so, if you see that the elevators are deflected, the elevators are the flaps which are behind the aircraft, and that causes its pitching moment to that aircraft. So, therefore, the elevator deflection gets into that equation as a control input. And WG is the disturbance, it's the wind gust disturbance. So, for example, W is the velocity in this direction. But if we have some wind velocity, that has an effect on this. So that's how the WG term appears. So now this system can be represented in the state space form as x dot, which is this. So x is w, q, theta, h. This is my state variables. So x dot is a times x plus b times u, the elevator deflection, plus e times w, where w is the wind gust, which is unknown to us, right? And height is the parameter which I'm trying to control, and therefore height is the output which I'm measuring. So this is, can be written as y is c times of x, right, which gets the height. Now, this is continuous model, but in reality we need to discretize, right? So, but since this has fast dynamics, we have to discretize it at, let's say, uh, 0 0.1 seconds or even faster than that. And then we end up in a discrete time state space model, which I will be using from now on. So which looks like xk plus 1 is axk, k is the time uh, step. So the time update looks like axk plus buk plus cwk. That's what I will be using here on. And these have constraints. So for example, the elevator deflection cannot be more than 0 0.3 radians, or let's say it has to be around 10 degrees. It cannot def be deflected more than that. Then the wind speed is restricted to one meters per second. And then the angular, dis uh, the angular uh, pitch rate cannot exceed 0 0.2 radians per second. These are hard constraints which are enforced on the system because of the physics of the system. And the control system must be such that these constraints have to be obeyed. So this is true for any scenario. And we need control systems which obey constraints. So that's the first key idea here. Um, that leads to my PhD work, which was done at Ghent University with my supervisor, Professor Robin Dikeser. 
and at Cambridge in UK with Professor Jan Majowski. Um, so I would like to introduce model predictive control to you um, by looking at Katniss Aberdeen in Hunger Games. So here her task is to shoot a target. Let us say I have George as my target. Um, so I need to shoot an arrow at him. And how I should do it is I can take a few steps. I predict my stance. So let's say I, I predict three steps in future. So I'm here. So I, I go one, two, and three. This is my prediction over the model, which I'm seeing George. And I predict that after taking three steps, my error to George is zero because my alignment is here. I'm reducing this error with him to zero. So I'm trying to optimize the distance between George and myself in a traject in an, an angular angular sense to zero. So if that is x, I want to minimize x because when x goes to zero, that's what I want. So it is sort of minimization of x squared, but over the prediction horizon, which is three steps in future, because this is what I'm predicting. But in doing so, I cannot violate constraints. So for example, I cannot hit this table, you know, because my movements are restricted here. So I cannot do this. So here, Canis will be doing the same. The constraints will be laser beams, which she cannot cross. And there will be targets which we sh she has to take down. And you have to pay attention to what I label below. So that, that's how I see model predictive control to be, because laser constraints are critical. Because if you cross, you are dead. So that the game is finished there. So those are hard constraints. And this is what is going on. Now we will get to know it a little better way, in a mathematical way. So what I'm trying to do is I'm minimizing a cost function, which I just said is x square. But that need not be x square. It can be anything. So that's what you write as a minimization, such that the dynamics of the system hold and the constraints are satisfied. And what's happening on the right-hand side is that you're seeing that what's the effect of prediction? What, is, what would happen if I change the control in a particular way? How would the trajectory look like? That's what you're looking at there. And so this optimization is performed every time step, again and again, repeatedly. And your horizon moves with you. So that's model predictive control. But I have shown this on a linear system because um, this could be nonlinear. If that is nonlinear, the resulting optimization problem may be very difficult because it's no longer convex. So, Lynch, so now we have, uh, yeah. So how much time does it take to, for this whole thing to converge? Because if you're talking about resilient systems, they might need to react within like a fraction of a second. So does it give results in that time frame? Yes, because the optimization is not, because at every step, it is, after all, a linear system. <coughs> The nonlinear system is being converted into a linear system at that point by the Taylor series. So you have an um, analytic solution to, of, to that problem at that, of that optimization problem at that point. It's just that you are repeatedly doing it at, the, at that time. Yeah, there is no guarantee that you will go to the local optimum. It depends on how much time you have. No, but suppose an aircraft is flying and so mm -hmm. see some, something in front of it. Mm -hmm. and the very idea of resilient control is that it needs to act very, very fast. This is not resilient control, but this is just nonlinear. Just, yeah. Just talking about MPC. Yeah. I am coming to resilient at, at a very later stage. So, yeah. This is at, so we will handle all those challenges step by step. So, so we now can design constraint controller that are fast, right? The next challenge is what, ha what happens if the system is time varying. So for that, we have at my PhD, this kind of an architecture. So where you have two levels now. So the, 
the low level, it's the control system which is tracking some reference trajectories. But what are these reference trajectories might not be known because they are not trivial. So those reference trajectories depend on the operating point, on what the temperature is, on, on several factors. So there is a high-level learning algorithm going on which actually tunes the reference trajectories with respect to the changing environmental conditions again and again and again till some performance is achieved. And at the low level, you are just tracking it with the MPC controllers. And now at the high level, you could also be tuning the model itself. You could be tuning the control parameters. You could do all sorts of things. So that was an architecture which we proposed there. And then we compared that with model-free techniques. So model-free techniques are, for example, you are, it's a bad example, but if you're trying to control an aircraft, let me say I, I do not have the model of this aircraft. So what am I going to do? I am going to perform this manipulation again and again and try to find that what kind of input trajectory gives me an optimal performance here, repeatedly, by some sort of optimization, without knowing what is inside this. Could be genetic algorithms, could be reinforcement learning, or whatever, more sophisticated deep, deep neural networks. So this could get this. But at the cost of repeatedly performing the same, which might not be safe in the case of an aircraft. So we did this comparison of model-based to model-free techniques, and we saw that the modeling requirement is, of course, worse for model predictive control, and it's good for genetic algorithms, but they do not need any model. But the learning rate is worse in GA and RL because it takes a lot of iterations. And stability, we cannot say anything about them. They are not analytic. Um, the learning, tra learning transient is also worse in the learning techniques. And the multi-objectiveness is better, in fact, in GA and RL, because multi-objective functions could be encoded directly at that problem. So this table sort of su summarizes. What are the various, uh, maybe you can explain the NMPC is what? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so this is the two-level nonlinear model predictive controller, so because they have two levels. And that is two-level iterative learning control, which I haven't explained, but let's skip that. But those two are model-based. And then IO is the iterative optimizer, gen genetic algorithms and reinforcement learning. Now, this has been applied to an automatic transmission. Now, an automatic transmission is an extremely, believe me, extremely difficult. And, I mean, I was crying in my PhD to solve this problem because it took me a couple of years to get anywhere near to that system. So what's happening is, there is the engine which is running, okay, at certain speed. Let's say in your car, and your, uh, your wheels are stationary. Now, you want to engage the wheels together with this engine, right? So that, let us say, without any gear, the speed matches with each other. Slip is something called the difference between these two velocities. So at the beginning, the slip is the highest, which is equal to this velocity, and at the end, it becomes zero when they match, right? Now, we want to engage this in such a way that the jerk is minimized. You do not feel the jerk when you engage that. So that has to happen. Okay, now we know everything, but we do not know how should we achieve this. I know the objective as an English statement, but I do not know what the reference trajectory should look, look like. And that's where the two level comes in. So let us not look at so much of details, but if you see here, so you control a pressure. So by that pressure, you are closing these two together. Okay, so that's the input, let's say. So what happens here is that if you keep the pressure high for a very large amount of time, what happens is you, you just hit it directly, and then you have a jerk, which is shown here. And if you notice that then the pressure profile decreases slowly after iteration 2 to 12, and then what happens is you give high pressure and then slow it down slowly, and then you have a smooth transition. So that's what is going on there. So this is how the problem is solved. Let's skip the details any further. And let us go then to distributed nonlinear model predictive control. So I do not know how many of you are Latin dancers or you appreciate Latin dancing. So I see it as a Latin dancing. So, so remember the inverted pyramid we have. We need to con construct the same inverted pyramid, but now over multiple players, okay? So let us say we are doing this uh, dance. Um, I think that's flamenco. I don't know. So um, in this flamenco, what's happening is the total cost function is the total dance performance. So 
both the dancers want that the dance itself should look good but the dance to in order for the dance to look good the personal dances have to be synchronized so the cost is a sum of the cost functions of both your performances right and that is this pyramid is the sum of v1 and v2 but v1 and v2 depend on u1 and u2 u1 is my step forward and u2 is your step backward if you both take step forward that's not longer a dance so how i solve this problem is so the dancer 1 computes the optimal move u1 star and dancer 2 and and communicates it to dancer 2 how does the communication happen you look at the feet right you are trying to take a step forward you see and then you take a step backward you communicate she looks at your feet and you go on so this is how the communication works and in a model predictive control scenario which is common to us i think when we are dancing we predict okay looks like she is going to take a step back if she takes a step back i should probably take a step forward i am thinking 5 seconds in future right so this is kind of predicting each other's moves so this is what helps in this uh, distributed predictive control right so i have two subsystems i have each controller in in this case our mind to and then we only exchange our current control move with each other and then the optimization is performed only based on my control move because i can only affect my control move right i i assume that maybe she is going to do this and take that into account in the model but so you see the optimization is fast you know why because let's say i have 100 dancers they have 100 footsteps but i am only optimizing with respect to my one footstep imagine a global control system which is optimizing this as a global globally then it will optimize with respect to 100 steps altogether and that's a very hard problem to be solved in real time so this is the upshot in this problem uh, i guess uh, when things are convex i think everything will work out okay because this is basically you're trying to use gauss seidel type approach coordinate descent. coordinate descent yeah so what happens when you have uh, lots of local minima because yeah so so again so that's the thing here so this is only guarantee local minima. yeah yeah again the same again so again it is so that coordinate descent which is working so what what by that what i mean is that at at one point of time she freezes only i take the step okay so that ensures that i am decreasing in one direction then i freeze she takes the step so you see this is going in this way so so i am in a coordinate sense i am descending but again the the entire pyramid as a function of both is again a local locally constructed because maybe at a very another point you are going further down but i never said i'm i'm just guaranteeing local convergence again so these using those step size as before i can guarantee that you keep going down and down and if i take one step and say i'm out of time you can stop there because even then you are going down down the cost function okay so that's that now <clears throat> now the question is that let us say that i want to learn her behavior and she wants to learn my behavior which is changing with respect to time i don't know why but it is changing okay so but my behavior which is my model affects her behavior and her behavior affects my behavior so this adaptation of models is interlinked in the same way as the control was interlinked right so how do you learn in that kind of setting how do you even identify such models so how do you identify such interlinked models is you have a you first construct a decentralized model so if i take a step how am i reacting to it that's called that decentralized model and then you see if she takes a step how am i uh, affected by that so that's the second part which comes into it so this is how you sort of construct it in a modular modular sense and then this learning algorithm what it does is it computes the parameter adaptation mind first again communicates back to the partner partner communicates the parameter adaptation communicates back to me and so on and so forth exactly in the same way as everything happened before except that now it's not a control problem anymore it's now a parameter estimation problem but everything else is the same so this is how that problem is solved now the experimental results of this are on a hydrostatic drive train now i'm really i think i'm not going to explain what that is just just have a look there we have two hydro motors okay 
and driven by one pump. So one pump, so the flow is one. It is being split into two hydromotors, right? One flow entering, which is driving two hydromotors. So it's extremely coupled, right? If I want to increase this speed, I increase this flow, but that will decrease this part, and so on and so forth. So this is the system that this is... the UTC system that does exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these are common in uh, heavy machinery and right. uh, lots of places. So, um, so, so the results show that even under that, those settings, by the distributed techniques which I have shown, you could go to different set points. It's still possible to do that in this kind of interacting settings. Um, and, the, and you also change the parameters. So the parameters were changed real time and you could track them. And the, one of my students did this project, which was um, leader follower. <laughs> So after distributed, so this is the second part of the. I don't know how much. Yeah, so, okay, I have enough time. So, so yeah, so so we have till now handled constraint systems with fast dynamics which are distributed systems as well, um, and to a certain extent, time variance as well by learning, you know. And the only thing which I am now focusing on would be vulnerability, right? This is a separate section. And, and because it's my postdoc, not only because of that, it is becoming increasingly important right now. So, so how do you know how much vulnerable these systems are and what could you do for resilience against these vulnerabilities? So let me motivate you. So cyber physical system security, cyber physical systems to me is a fancy name of dynamical systems. I mean, in, even in other dynamical systems, we had some part where we were communicating. Right? So anyway, so... The whole so, mechatronics, they just made it sexy. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. So some money-making mechanism. So this, this thing came into... So this is the same that you have a physical system and there's a cyber part. Which, is, which are just the signals, you know, communicating back and forth. Now, FAA has reported that, so Boeing uh, 787 is vulnerable to hackers. Okay, this is, this is for real, which is happening. And this is the threat scenario which the FAA is giving you, that attackers could come in any of those ways. Not only in GPS, through GPS, but in various other communications. You could just poof off those things. Now, the question is, if you change those communications how much would be the effect, right? So that is what we're going to see. Um, so again, model-based vulnerability assessment. So every system has actuators, states, and sensors, right? Every control systems. Now, of course, the attack could be done at each stage or at multitude of those steps. So you could attack the actuators itself. So you could attack the elevators directly um, by I don't know, putting a missile, and you could attack the state, which is more subtle. How do I know what are the states in the aircraft? So I, we know, but really, how do you change them? That's difficult. Then is the sensors. You could change the altimeter readings. You could change the GPS, which I just said. So it seems rather plausible for me to be able to change the sensors. Okay. And there are many ways of attacking. So one is called stealth attack. Stealth attack means that you change the sensor values only that much to which the detector is not able to detect, right? Now, if I say that my height is some 1,000 meters over, now I will catch you, you know, this is not possible. If I say, okay, the height is just one meter over the real height, oh yeah, this is possible because, you know, one meter per second is the wind velocity. So that is stealth attack. And then is replay attack. So I don't know how many of you know Stuxnet, Stuxnet, Stuxnet is a very, very famous attack which was done on Iran's uh, nuclear reactors. So what Stuxnet did was the operators are all watching what's going on. Okay, So what Stuxnet did was it was recording all the data first and then just replayed this data back. So these guys saw the things which was happening much before and at that time it took over the system. 
So as a result, Iran's plan were supposedly gone back by two years or something. It slowed down there. Uh, anyway, so there are other kinds of attack which are false data injection and covert attacks, which I will not go into, but this, this is how it, we do it. So I think at this point we are bored enough to see some, some another snippet. So this is the work at uh, Urbana Champaign. This is my supervisor, Cedric Langbot, and we work in a place called Coordinated Science Lab. Uh, which is an amalgamation of various disciplines. The project is funded by National Science Foundation, and we would see what an attacker wants to do in a stealth attack scenario. Okay, so this is a scene from Entrapment. I don't know how many of you have seen this. So here, Catherine Zeta Jones is the attacker. Okay, now the real challenge of the attacker is to know how big the disturbance is. So how big the wind disturbance is? Because I want to hide within the wind disturbance. If I don't know how big it is, I will be caught. Right? So first is that for her is to know how big the disturbance is. For her, it will be some sorts of maze she has to identify. But the attacker is blindfolded because the attacker has not access to everything, all the information. So the attacker is blindfolded. And there is a monitor who has fixed some alarms. So the alarms are if you're while attacking, if you attack with the power higher than the disturbance, then the alarm bells will ring. Okay, you will see all that here. And but still, you have to attack. So let us. Is this absolutely necessary? Yes, because you won't be able to see them, and, and I you will. You will, right? This is the estimation of the disturbances going on, or the, or the set, which are the ropes. So a control system under attack looks like that. So we have a plant, we have a sensor, there is a state estimator, there's a controller, there is a defense mechanism which is just checking the plausibility of the system, right? So if I am at this particular state and I encounter a maximum disturbance, whatsoever it is, then I will land up in some particular set of states and then I will check the measurement. Does that belong to this particular set of states? Yes or no? And that, that is all. It's just checking the plausibility. And the attacker is estimating the, that disturbance set and using it to inject an attack signal on the sensor and trying to deceive the system, right? So this is what is going on. So you see that this is the signal which is being added by the attacker on the sensor. So what I want is that if a flight is going in one way, I just want to take it on the other. So this is what, what the objective is. So how does the detection mechanism look like? I just explained to you. So I start from an initial set of states, which I know as the monitor is. I know the model, so I can propagate it one step forward in time, which is called the reach, reach of the current set of states. So I, I then have an ellipse, right? But at that point of time, I am having a measurement, a true measurement. So I can also say what all set of states would generate that true measurement. And that is that box. So the intersection of these two are the plausible set of states. Now, if the intersection is zero, that means there is an attack. If it is not, then you update the initial states to the intersection and go on. So this is the monitor. You could do better, but this is how it is now. Now, now I want to design the stealth attack. Okay, so 
The stealth attack is, I am now minimizing my output with respect to an attack trajectory, an attack target, right? So I'm minimizing that, but with respect to the worst possible disturbances. So that's why it's, it's a minimization over a maximization problem. So I'm minimizing my, my orientation to the attack vector, but with respect to the maximum worst disturbances, which could come because I do not know what disturbances are going to come, right? So that's a min-max plan under worst possible disturbances. So but the typical case or measurement, what you think, what the defender thinks is the measurement, right? Yeah, so yeah. According to your notation, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. So this is the part of measurement. But instead of, this is not a control problem here, okay? It's a... Um, yeah, so it is now, my control signal is now actually the sensor measurement, right? So how much I should perturb it, but there is a constraint on that sensor measurement. And that constraint is that that sensor measurement should be such that I must lie in that intersected set. So in principle, I would try to make it at the, go to the end of that set. Because if I go beyond, then I'm detected, right? Because then the intersection becomes null. So these have to be touching to each other, those. So that's what it does. And now this problem is solved by linear matrix inequalities, which I'm not going to say how. Now, I have shown you the model of uh, um, the aircraft. Now, the parameters for a Boeing 747 are known, and we can put, in, we can fit it into that model. And once we do that, the WG, if you remember, looks like that. No, it sort of gives a pitching moment, the wind disturbance. So I am going to use the wind disturbance to take the aircraft from one point to another. So the first step is estimation of the wind bounce, of the wind gust. So if you see, I start very conservatively, but slowly I start learning this set. This is what happens here. Now I have to use this information. Now if you see the diagram at the top, the altitude command is commanded to plus 20 meters over the trim point. So I am flying at 40,000 feet at 0 0.8 Mach right now. Now I want it to go plus 20 meters. So the MPC takes it to plus 20 meters, that's the light green color. But at that point, I start attacking the um, altimeter reading. And in fact, I take it to minus 20 meters, and I'm not detected. These are the detection limits. So if you see the behavior before and the behavior later, the, the later I was forced to the extreme of that set, of the detection set. But in between, it was random. So I just go from a plus 20 to minus 20 without being detected. So that's a cardinal. So it's like hijacking the aircraft. So I'll give you a demonstration of this. So here the hijacking is done from 30 meters to 60 meters.
so now then the, then the challenge is that okay it, it, it took from plus 20 to minus 20 but can I, can it take to infinitely some some place we want to restrict that we want to say that okay I am open to attacks but you know I'm not open to any kinds of damage I will limit my damage to success to some set okay in, in, I will bound my damage I am I am saying that I cannot protect myself completely but I am saying that I can protect myself to a certain extent you cannot do anything with me. This is what is this. So how do you get this? So this resilience, the first step is that the estimation you error you make has to be bounded. You cannot make infinite estimation error. Because if you make maximum estimation error, that then your controller cannot do much, you know. So the estimation error has to be bounded first. So a bounded estimation error is possible based on the system dynamics. If you have the system dynamics and you know the disturbance sets, which is W and the noise V, then you can bound the, over a window of uh, uh, prediction, you can bound the uh, state. So for example, the car, I'm estimating the car, I'm just saying that I'm estimating it within a tube. The maximum error is that much. I will not make an error more than that. But next, the question is, now I have a bounded estimator in place because I do not know the state, right? I mean, I only measure the height. I have to know the state. So a bounded estimation is necessary. So next is, how do I use this in control to get, again, bounded error? So which means that my controller has to be within some set called an invariant set. So invariant set means that once I'm in that set, I will never leave that set. Okay? So that's invariance. And something called control invariance Control invariance means that, let's say I'm in this room, and my control input is my step. It means that no matter where I am in this room, I will figure out a step such that I will remain in this room again and again. So this is called control invariance. So in this case, we want control invariance. So which means that no matter how much the attacker has attacked me, still I will find a step to come back to the room, you know? So, so, so you have the estimator now. And I know that the estimator is bounded in that uh, here. So the estimator is bounded in that set. So the maximum error I know I will make is that much. So what you do is you say that the predicted state one step ahead lies in an invariant set with the quadragon difference of the error set. So now explain part. So if you guys know what a Minkowski sum is, if, if you add a set to a set, it becomes like that. And if you, it's the opposite in yeah, uh, people kind of opposite. collision detection. Yeah, yeah, kind of opposite is point dragging difference, which means that if you use this, actually what happens is at this state, when you actually go to that state, let's say the maximum error you make is this. So you take a Minkowski sum of that, these two cancel out, and then you are again in this invariant set. So you keep in that invariant set, no matter how much that actor is doing. So that's how you, you never exit that set. So I can say that I always die in the C infinity set. I cannot make more error on, over that. So the resilience I explained on a pitch rate attack. Can you go back to previous figure? Do you have an index problem in the estimation equation? Go back up. Maybe. In the top thing, at the K is uh, X hat K. Is no, it? I. What is the K phi mean? Oh, the phi. Oh, sorry. So the phi is the uh, augmented uh, matrix. Right. So X plus is AX plus BU. And so X plus plus will be A square X plus that. So, so that's the... So that's the dagger I understand. What, the and the K. K, K is the row. Okay, okay. K is row. Okay. Yeah, so that will multiply with that. Okay. Can you explain a little bit details? Of? Of, of the estimated part. Oh, sure. I mean, this is actually good. So, okay, so... Are you using any compressed sensing ideas there? Because your Z dimension is always going to be less than X, right? And yeah, no, no, well, not uh, not here, but you could. So that's something called lasso, where, okay, yeah, yes. you could use the, those ideas of compressed sensing, where, yeah, uh, you sort of penalize the one norm, or, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. You could use that, but I'm not using it here. Okay. I, I though have used that in identifying the disturbance. Uh, 
set. So do you assume then your uh, measurement dimension is same as your state dimension? It's not necessary. Okay. It's not necessary. You could okay. use a pseudo inverse. I see. So you're just doing the two norm. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here I'm showing that if you attack my pitch rate, so the pitch rate is supposed to go there. Even after attack, you cannot do much carnage. You know, you could because the red line is the result of the attack. It would be limited to some some set. So the hypothetical scenario which is going on is at the top. So the aircraft trajectory is shown. Now the a possible attack trajectory is shown with a dotted line. But all I'm saying is that in this attack scenario, if you compute the reach of that attack scenario, it must lie in some safe region, which is the big circle, circular dotted line. So because of the estimation error E you make, you will never exit sort of that kind of a safe region. And if you do exit that safe region, then your control is, then your system is not resilient anymore. So some ideas are in, in that, that way. So I think that's all about the research. Um, so some, some quick uh, perspectives of where we, I, I see it should go forward is that first, you should need integration of all that I have talked. So which means new techniques of design and compositions are important. So which means that today I am working on an altitude control system. Tomorrow somebody comes with a lateral control system and you fit it onto that. This shouldn't change the properties of the system. My resilience properties have to still be there in that system. Okay, So that's what is meant by composition. So it should preserve robustness, performance, and security properties. The second is adaptation. So continuous learning and adaptation is necessary because the attacker might change every day. It's not only for attack problem, for time varying situations. You cannot always recreate control designs. So continuous learning is necessary and automatic synthesis at some point of time. And this is just showing that how difficult the system becomes with number of inputs and outputs, number of <coughs> systems, subsystems, and with the degree of modelability, how difficult this is. And that cube, that hypercube shows that if you have <coughs> more knowledge, then attacking is easier. And if you have lesser knowledge, then attacking is harder. So a resilience system would try to shrink it, and the attacker would try to expand it. So the very last, one of the concrete objectives is that this kind of model-based synthesis, of course, needs interdisciplinary, we need to cross these boundaries because we need ideas from learning community, we need to uh, put it in controls, maybe even from psychology of what are the intentions of an attacker, how does he think, so psychological can come in as well, so human uh, machine interaction, all those things have to come in to really be able to solve this uh, problem. But in these five ways, concretely, you could tackle this. So first is you model the system, so using system identification, but in a modular sense, how I explained. So you first model it. Second, you do model-based control, constraint control, which is MPC, nonlinear MPC, distributed MPC. The third is how do you have robustness to time variance? So then you have to introduce learning at some level. Either it could be reference, or it could be parameters, or, and so on. And fourth, which is these days the most important, is certification. So you have to certify that this system on two levels, first is that they are stable and in sense of boundedness and they converge, which I, which I showed, there's a guaranteed cost decrease. So this kind of certification. The second is certified to be resilient. So, which I also showed how you do that. So against various models. So this resilience must be there. So the certification of systems. And last is large scale systems, you know, very large scale systems. So distributed systems, but still, these techniques have to be fast, and this should be implementable on embedded systems at a very large scale. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for a very interesting and definitely animated <laughs> talk. Uh, first, we'll ask the students to ask questions if they have any. Okay, faculty. Okay. So in, in your framework, like how do you distinguish robustness with the resilience concept? Yeah, well, it's a very tricky question which I, which you always get from reviewers. It's a, well, 
the answer could be you do not have to, right? So you do not have to. So, um, so the, the fault, so maybe the question is, what is a fault and what is the attack? So, what's the difference mm-hmm. between robustness and resilience in your framework? How do you distinguish them? Yes, I, all I'm saying is it is not necessary. It is, it is not necessary to distinguish that. So, so whether the, it is due to a uncertainty, whether it is due to a fault or it, it is due to an attack, at this point may not be necessary to di- distinguish. So my system is resilient to all, let us say. I can handle uncertainty, I can handle attacks, I can handle faults. Yeah, the, the way I, I do it, I mean, that's, that's a very good question and it's, it's a conceptual question. Yeah. So robustness is what you do before you actually put the system yeah, in the field. Yeah. It's basically make sure that mm-hmm. what you know, you basically are uh, designing your system for things that you know, mm-hmm. right? And the, the things that, I mean, known unknowns is what you're designing for some kind of adaptation. Because even if you design your system for robustness, things can still go outside. Yes, yes. So you're basically adapting to some model parameters, for example. So resilience, I see, is the higher level where you still need to do identify it, a new system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but for example, maybe diagnose that there's a fault, diagnose that there's an attack, and then you do you you basically respond to the situation. So, robustness is the lowest thing. Adaptation, resilience. That's how I look at it. Yeah. So, well, yes. So the adaptation, yes. The thing is, I haven't done. So I was not saying about the adaptation because. I didn't do adaptation in, in the resilience framework here. So this is the next step. Next step is to, yeah, to, to keep learning, to keep adapting, uh, because the attacker is changing his intents. So that is the next step. But in the current framework, I have considered them to be the same. Now, resilience, I see it is where things have changed. You really don't, didn't know what the system was. I think one that is a totally new situation. Resilience should be a higher level, is what yes, I think. Uh, one additional point uh, in addition to what just said is that uh, in terms of resilience, we have to think about the emergency situation. So right. it's like really, really quick responding. Yeah. Like you have to respond very quick. So Your whole idea. concept of ma- of what the system is has changed. Yes. So you, you really are in a new situation. You need to figure out what's going on. That's, yeah. a, that's where you're, you're resilient. Well, I am not resilient in my case to that situation because I am giving you an opportunity to attack. Okay. I'm saying I will not, I will not do anything. You, yeah. you may so attack. basically, your thing is more of more of a robustness. Yeah, yeah. that's what I said. Like yeah. I deal it with the same same perspective. But definitely, the next step is to do this recognition and act more on that. Right. I'm not doing anything here. I'm just beforehand telling that I will. I am here. So whenever, whenever you do pre-planning, that's basically yeah, yeah. robustness. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. When you change things or the adaptation. Yeah. Resilient is, a hey, you're, you suddenly got hit. <laughs> Yeah, like, so both have to be... <laughs> you, you don't know what the, what's going on, so you need to figure out what's going on. Yeah, both have to be there. So in right. fact, robustness is something the attacker used right. in the first place. Because we were ready for uncertainty and he uses the uncertainty. So you're basically, you're doing, you're basically planning your system for the non-nons. Yeah, correct. correct. Yeah. Terminology. yeah. My question is, for the resilient control or to certify or resiliency, mm-hmm. you need to solve your max main problem, the semi infinite program, mm-hmm. and you need to solve for the first time. You need to solve something globally, otherwise you don't certify. Uh, yeah, let me see. So, or am I missing something? No, I, I think the for the certification is this step here. So I just have to compute the C infinite, the invariant set here. So the the max min was for that. The attacker does the max min. The attacker uses it to attack, right? So, so the so the min was the attacker was using it to attack, uh, tolerating the worst case mind. disturbances, right? But I think the the other problem is completely offline here. So this is another advantage here is that the invariant set is computed offline, no matter how complicated it is. It is complicated. Computation of invariant set is very complicated. But the C infinity is totally offline. Once you have this, you want to do this computation online. And this will have the property because of this set. This will have the property. So this is not difficult. Uh, I mean, the online part is not difficult. The offline part is difficult. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much again.